Okay. So, welcome back, everybody. Um, so today we're going to continue with functions of several variables and try to really uh, get the notion of our first notions, first notions of uh, derivatives and so functions of several variables. So, I'm going to actually start doing multivariable calculus today. Um, but before we get there, we want to finish up the conversation on limits um, of functions of several variables. Last time I told you there's sort of pathological behavior in several dimensions that maybe we wouldn't see in one dimension, uh, just owing to the fact that we have a lot of different ways we can approach a point um, in more than one dimension. So I'm going to give you some prototypes some prototypes of limit type questions that you might see on homeworks or on exams. And um, just there's kind of a general way you can see whether limits exist, uh, whether they don't exist, and what are some standard tests you can use in these different problems. So let's just start with a few problems. Usually there's some expression that says, you know, find the limit if it exists. And um, and basically you want to uh, often explain, I mean, on a, instructions you'll say, if it does not exist, explain. So you want to show that it doesn't exist, not just right, does not exist. Explain why. Okay, so here are three different problems and all of them will share kind of a, a feature that I'm going to approach the origin in each of these cases. And each of them are what are known as rational functions, which means it's a polynomial in two variables uh, over another polynomial in two variables. So there's one limit, here's the second limit. And here we'll have xy over uh, x squared, y squared plus x squared, same denominator. And then finally, third limit. So I think we might have done this last time. So maybe I'll just remind us ourselves of the way we do three in general. So as you said, as I was just saying, each of these are some polynomial in two variables, which means they're made up of like products of x's and y's are monomials and then you take sums of different products. Um, so the numerator is of that type and the denominator is of that type for each of these cases. Now the thing to distinguish in these three cases is the order of the numerator versus the order of the denominator. And so if you're looking at a limit, the order of a monomial or a polynomial will be obtained by essentially looking at the exponents of X and Y and adding them up, okay? So just do a little bit of analysis here. These different cases, so we'll go to the solution. We'll look at the order of the numerator over the order of the denominator. So the order of the numerator here is two plus two. Take the exponents of X and exponent of Y and add them up. So two plus two equals four, that's the numerator. Whereas the denominator, well, you look at the, if you have a sum of monomials, which each of these is called a monomial, just products of the variables. You look at the maximal 
order. So you look at the highest order. In this case, they're equal. And so each of these is for the denominator. Now, so let, we'll, let's push off this, these other two cases for a moment. When you have the numerator having the same order as the denominator, almost invariably, not always, but almost invariably, the limit won't exist, almost. And that's not something you should, okay, so that's a way of you deciding what method to use. It's not, you shouldn't write, okay, well, the orders are equal, so the limit doesn't exist. It's more, that's a hint that will tell you that probably the limit does not exist in this case. And as I said, yes. Yeah, so good, good question. So the question was, what, what happened to y to the fourth? So y to the fourth is equal to x to the zero times y to the fourth. And so this has order zero plus four, which is four. So, you, as I was saying, so you, if you have several, so maybe in one more example, let's say we had y to the, uh, let's say we had x times y, uh, y to the, to the third plus x squared plus y cubed. So the order of this whole thing would be four. You take the maximum of all of them. So here you have a one, one plus three is four, two is two and three is three, but four is the biggest. So you take the largest. Good questions. Other questions? Yes. Yep. Taking the maximum of all the sort of exponents. You use five, is y to the fifth. Right. Sort of the leading order term. Okay, so right. So you take you take this maximum thing, and this will give you a hint as to what the behavior is of this function. So when you have the order on the numerator is equal to the order in the denominator, as I was saying, it's a hint that the limit probably does not exist. And the way you can show that uh, in this case, I'm gonna erase this, sorry, posterity. <laughs> the way you can show this, so we're gonna, we get a hint here that it's, limit does not exist, but we put this on scratch paper. We don't share this hint with our grader. <laughs> um, and the way we show this is we take different approaches. So try different approaches. To the origin. I mean, the, in general, you wanna try different approaches to the limit point, but here we're looking at the origin as limit point. So we're going to go to so one approach is to take, to go along the line, say x equals zero, as we did last time. So we took x equaling zero, then we'll get that the limit, if it did exist, well, here, I'm sorry, guys, I'm gonna speed myself up here. Thanks. Hmm. Guess I'm gonna slow myself down. So if it did exist, this limit would then equal the limit as x approaches, or sorry, as y approaches zero of zero squared y squared, uh, zero squared. I'm just substituting for zero for x, fourth. But this, of course, is zero. I mean, I've got a zero on the numerator, the whole thing is zero. On the other hand, we could also look at uh, the case. So this is the case x equals zero. We can also look at the case of x equals y. And here, just as we did last time, we'll just set these two variables both equal to say y. We'll take the limit as y approaches zero. And here we'll get, uh, x, oops, y squared, y squared, y squared, y squared plus y to the fourth. And again, this is just like last time, it's the same kind of thing. Although in general, you might get different fractions, but here you get one half, which is one half. And these two are not equal. So you can then say the limit does not exist. 
So the moral of the story is really when you're deciding, if you have a rational function like this, you're approaching zero, you want to kind of decide that you're going to show maybe one that the limit exists or it doesn't exist before you try to compute. Uh, checking the orders will give you a hint. And if the orders are equal, the hint is it does not exist. On the other hand, we can look at the orders here. We get the numerator as order what? Two, one plus one is two, right? Because this is X to the first, Y to the first. Whereas the denominator is still what it was before. It's just four. Now in this case, you will expect that the limit again does not exist, or you could think of it as sort of diverging to infinity um, in general. So the behavior of, of functions like this is that again, the hint is that it does not exist. The numerator order is, is smaller than the denominator or has sort of infinite type behavior. In other words, it goes to plus or minus infinity. And there is notions of limits being going to infinity, but if you say a limit doesn't exist and you're explaining that it tends to infinity, that's full credit, that's fine. I'm not gonna. Move. And again, and here, if you're gonna show something it tends to infinity, it suffices to show that along any given path. So if it goes to infinity along one path, then the limit doesn't exist. You're gonna get, go to infinity. So again, you can take something like X equals Y in this case, and you can look at this limit and you're going to get that this is then equal to limit as y approaches zero of y squared again over, but now you get y, sorry, y squared, y squared plus y to the fourth. And now you don't get full cancellation, right? You get limit as y approaches zero of one over two y squared which of course you can see, you know, as y approaches zero, this goes to infinity. So again, it's fine with me if you see, if you make an argument like this to say, okay, well, then the limit doesn't exist. And I will instruct graders to give full credit for such an answer. So in both of these cases, by looking at the order, well, you see slight differences. In the first case, we saw that we get sort of finite values, but they're different. In the second case, we get something that's sort of blowing up and it can go to negative infinity too, depending on the situation. Um, it also can kind of go all over the place, but. The third case, however, is a case where we do get a, oops, <laughs> where we do get a limit. So here we have the order. What's the order of the numerator here? Four, great. Just write n for numerator. And the denominator? Two. Again, we take the maximum. So they're both two in this case. So the maximum. And here the limit will exist. The hint is that the limit, if the order of the numerator, imp, hint, exists. If the order of the numerator is greater than the order of the denominator, then we, the hint is that it will exist and equal zero. And again, this applies when we're approaching the origin. We're approaching the origin. But these are the sort of prototypes. You can shift things around. You can put some other functions in, square roots and so on, uh, and get all kinds of business. So, and the, now we don't use different approaches. So this is what I was trying to emphasize last time. The, the different approach thing that is there to show certain limits don't exist, but it's not really effective at showing a certain limit exists and is equal to a value. So for here, for this one, I think last time we did this problem, uh, but here the best thing to use is sort of a squeeze uh, argument, squeeze theorem. So you use squeeze theorem. 
maybe in polar coordinates or something. So I'll, I'll let you look at last week's lecture to, to sort of go through that particular example again, if you need a refresher. Okay, so the, but I wanted to go over this type of a setup because these, again, these are the things you might find on exams uh, in this class, but they're also, you know, they're illustrative of uh, a lot of behavior that you see for several different sort of indeterminate forms and uh, several variable functions. All right, now, we do indeed need these notions if we're going to define differentiability in higher dimensions. However, we do not need these notions if we're going to define partial derivatives in several variables. And practically speaking, uh, what we do is we define partial derivatives and we almost exclusively work with partial derivatives and rely on some kind of heavier theorems to say that that's all we need to work with. So kind of putting underneath the rug uh, the notion of limit in higher dimensions. But those theorems, you know, you want to be aware of them because sometimes they don't work in their conditions. There are some conditions that you need to be aware of. But for now, we're just going to move on and talk about partial derivatives. Okay. So what is a partial derivative? Well, it deals with derivatives of functions of several variables. So, and again, in this text and in this uh, course, we generally use two, two variables as our main example or three variables. So I'll define it for general case as well. So a partial derivative of f of xy, or more generally, a function of, say, n variables um, with respect, so partial derivatives are with respect to a particular variable, x. Um, I'll just say with respect to X, we'll talk about the one with Y in a second, uh, is the following thing. We take, well, I sorry, at, at, I need it at a point. So it's just like a derivative. I need it at a point with respect to X at AB is the following limit. We take the limit as H approaches zero of F of X, or sorry, A plus H, B minus F of A, B over H. And this whole thing has notation attached to it. And there's, just like in one variable, there are several different forms of notation. You know, one variable, you have F prime, you have DDT of F and all of that. Um, or ddx of f, uh, there's, no, I don't, there's not really, there is actually some notation for f prime, but it's not, uh, it's a little bit funky looking and usually comes in later courses. But in this case, we write it del f, the most standard notation you'll see is del f del x. And then here we're evaluating at a, b. Another notation that you'll see in the book is you'll write f sub x at a b. Okay. So these are no, this is notation. Both of these are, mean the same thing. So this is partial derivative with respect to x. If we want it with respect to y, well, we can just copy <laughs> and make some changes. So let's just make a little, a couple of changes. And voila, we're done. <laughs> okay. 
so what it so I want people to observe one thing first, and then we'll see what this is talking about. Okay. This is not a limit of a function of two variables. Okay. That's one thing I want you to observe. So we are, we learned just a minute ago, and we were just talking about some problems related to limits of functions of several variables. These limit definitions of partial derivatives are not limits of several variables. They're limits of a single variable, namely h in this case. So that makes them, sort of puts them outside a little bit of the general conversation of multivariable calculus of limits of several variables and derivatives. And as I said a moment ago, what we'll do is we'll talk about differentiability of a function, which does involve limits of several variables and is then related to these notions and allows us to just work exclusively with these notions. So that's something to note, make a mental note of. Now, what, let's talk about what these things are. <laughs> what are these things? Okay. Well, let's say our function is defined on the whole plane, just so we avoid any kind of weird behavior. And so this is our x, y plane. And our function, you know, takes in points on the plane and returns a scalar, returns a number. And let's say we have some point out here. This is the point that we're interested in a, b. We're taking our partial derivatives of f with respect to x and y at a and b. Okay, so what we can do, so we can kind of color in this picture a little bit. Now, let's take a look at what's going on up here. Does this remind you of anything, this expression? It looks a little like the definition of the derivative in one variable, right? And indeed, it is the definition of the derivative in one variable obtained by fixing the second coordinate, y coordinate of b. So in fact, what we're doing here is we're taking a line through this point, and we're looking at a function of a single variable, namely the x variable, along this line. And we're asking for the rate of change of that function with respect to that x variable along that line at this point. It's the ordinary derivative, one variable derivative, okay? And that's what we're getting here for our partial derivative. Similarly, if we want it with respect to y, we go along this vertical line, we fix x, we fix x at a, and we just travel along this vertical line. And we ask for the rate of change of f when we're traveling along that line. So this is what these partial derivatives are telling us. They're telling us rates of change as we go in particular directions through a point. To like foreshadow what we're, talk, what we're going to do when we deal with differentiability and to ask the question, you may ask, what happens if I go through this line or this line, right? Can I use these two sort of rates of change to calculate the rates of change as I take different approaches, different straight line approaches? And the answer is if your function is differentiable, yes. And so most of the functions, the vast majority of functions we'll be dealing with are differentiable. So that's why these partial derivatives suffice um, yeah, in the future. All right. So now I want to make a note. So that's the, that's the definition. Oops. That's the definition of these guys. So let's make a note. So partial derivatives. And this follows from this definition in a sense are as easy to compute and work with as one variable derivative. And the trick is to pretend, so the trick here is to pretend 
the other variables. A constant or just numbers. You will confuse yourself if you don't kind of do this trick at some point. <laughs> like for some certain functions, maybe it won't be confusing at all, but uh, sometimes you, you may confuse well. This is a trick that I think is helpful for some students. So it's not really a trick, it's just a mental way of thinking about it. So let's, let's do a couple of problems. Let's see what I mean by this. Okay, so find. Now, of course, I, I said you wanted to, I, I didn't write down the definition, but you can easily, hopefully, write down the definition for a function of n variables, partial derivative with respect to xi of n variables. It's the same idea. You keep the other variables constant and you just change that ith variable and take the derivative with respect to that ith variable. Okay, I won't write that down, but you should look it up. And again, I wanna say that, you know, uh, that this is, The n variable case is really the case where you're going to see in a lot of applications that aren't like physically based. So a lot of mathematical models, you know, restricting yourself to two variables is really inadequate. So you want to have this kind of, you know, higher higher number of variables option, certainly for this stuff. Okay. All right. So find the partials derivatives. LF to LX, LF to LY uh, for the following functions. Same one, F of XY equaling X squared plus YX minus E to the Y, two F of X, well, let me call it G of XY. Well, I wrote, ah, I'll write that, sorry f of xy equal cosine xy uh, minus natural log of x plus y. Okay. So solutions. Do one first. So So what I need to do if I'm gonna take del f del x is I want to think what I'm doing here is I'm taking the derivative of the, this function, but I'm treating y as though it were like three. Okay. I think of y as just a number. I don't think of y as, and the point, the point of thinking of it that way is it's not changing, it's a constant, okay? So if I do that, well, all of the usual rules with derivatives apply. I can take the derivative with respect to each sum end and add them up afterwards. So here I'll get a two X here. And here I've got Y times X, but I'm taking the derivative with respect to X. I think of Y as like three, that would be three. So here I'll just get Y. And then the derivative of this with respect to X is zero because if I'm fixing Y, that's just a constant. I'm taking the derivative of a constant. Is it clear? Okay. All right. So this is a function, and of course you can evaluate this at a point. So if I wanted to put a bar here and put AB, I can put in those values and I'll get a number. Likewise, if I take del F del Y, X squared now is constant. Think of, if I think of X as being, you know, seven, that's just 49, right? Constant, take the derivative of constant, I get zero. Here I've got Y times seven, so I'll just get seven. If I think of X as a number, so I'll just get X in this case. And E to the Y, well, there's no X dependence at all. And so, I mean, no X in that expression, so I'll just get negative E to the Y. Does it make sense? 
Now, this is this first example is not too bad. And the second example is not either, but uh, again, you kind of want to get used to playing with this stuff. So if I take, in the second example, if I take del f del x, then I will get the derivative. So now I'm taking this cosine of x, y. Again, I want to think of y as being constant. I take the derivative of cosine of five times x. I don't get, you know, negative sine of uh, a five x. I have to actually use a chain rule here. And that's still the case here. So I'll get minus y sine x y. And here, well, again, think of y as being like five or something. I'll get just minus one over x plus five, or, but now I put in y up here. And when I say to think of it as a number, I don't mean actually put a number in. <laughs> I mean, like, think of it as just being constant, fixed, independent of x. Think of that, uh, the other variables as being that way. And I think the thing about this, this case is really to remember that you do need to use the chain rule and, you know, bring, treat y as, as a constant. Similarly, you can, I mean, so this is very symmetric with respect to x and y. So you'll get a very similar thing, but not the same. Uh, when you take the partials with respect to, to y. So you get negative x sine xy minus one over x plus one. This is one of those things that I think if you, you know, if you do about 10 of them, you know, 10 different problems like this, you'll get very bored and you'll be like, okay, I know how to do this. But maybe the first two or three, you might make a few little minor mistakes. Okay. Questions? Minor mistakes with this are pervasive, as, as is the case with integration. When we get to that, we'll see a lot of, I see a lot of mistakes and they're not, I can see that people understand it, but a lot of the times, again, the practice will really uh, help. Okay. So just like in calculus, in one variable calculus, what you can do once, you can do twice and three times and so on. And higher partial derivatives um, are everywhere in applications. And so we wanna get a sense as to what those mean and what their notation is. Um, so if you want to define, let's say I have a function x, f, and I want to take del f del x. Well, the way I like to think of this is I like to think that I'm doing something to f to get a new function. So another form of notation, which I didn't write above, but is perfectly acceptable, is to think, well, what I'm doing here is I'm taking this, some kind of thing called an operator. I'm taking f and I'm operating on it with this, this guy to get a new function as we did in this example. So when you write it that way, you'll get a better sense of the order. You start with a function and then you hit it with del del x. You hit it with a par first partial with respect to x. And if you, you know, then if you, as I said, if you do that once, you can do it twice. So now if I consider, uh, del squared f, del y del x, what is that? This is by definition, this is just, we take del, del y, del, del x. So we first take the partial with respect to x and then with respect to y. the definition. This is also written, again, this is notation, this is f, x, y. So there's a bit of a reversal here. You can see that the, the y here comes first, but now the y is, and the way you think of it is, what are you doing to the function? You first 
take the partial with respect to X and then you take the partial with respect to Y. All right, so now let's look at an example. So again, what you can do once you can do as many times, just like in one variable calculus, taking a second derivative isn't that much harder than taking a first. If you do it once, you can do it again. But let's take a look. So let's look at an example. Say from problem one. Above. So let's compute uh, f of x, y. Well, okay, I have to remember what we did. So here was one. This is our original function. Now we already did a little bit of the work, right? So this is equal to del del y, del del x of f. And we already computed this del del x of f. That's two x plus y. This is del del y, two x plus y. Now two x we treat as a constant because we're taking the partial with respect to y. So that goes to zero. And then the derivative with respect to y of y is just one. Make sense? What about fyx? Well, this will be del del x of del del y of f. And we see up here that this is del del y of f. So we get del del x. Del is for delta for those that are, it's just sort of a way that people express notation. So del del x of x minus e to the y. This is also e to the y is constant with respect to x. I'm taking the partial with respect to x, so we, it, that partial does not see e to the y, just sees x. So I get one again. So what do people think? Is this like amazing? All right, <laughs> yes, very good, very good point. So, so I've used this, <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat that pun. I have this awful, it's called people clairvoyant, this clairose theorem. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's the worst, I'm the worst, okay. Clairaut's theorem. This gentleman just said, well, he noticed that they're both one. So they're equal. Now, the question is, are they always equal? And the answer is no, they're not always equal. But if you have some mild assumptions that you can, you know, you can give yourself, then uh, they are. So, and this is where these kind of main definitions that I, you know, I've kind of insisted that we at least have as a part of the course uh, come into play. So if both of these partials, second partials exist or are defined because they are, they do involve these one variable limits in both cases and furthermore are continuous. then they're equal. Right. So that is, uh, that is great news for you guys, right? That's great news because if they weren't equal and you had high partial derivatives you had to take, there would be a lot of different computations that you would have to do. But this, this sort of commutativity, we call this commutativity of first partials, uh, this allows you to really speed up computations um, pretty generally. And there's actually some nice examples of this. We'll see as we go along. 
it's useful to know this fact. So maybe here's a problem that yeah, I used to, so I used to ask problems like this. I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe they'll fire me if I keep asking these problems. Let's see. You guys can complain. We'll see what happens. So find, here we're gonna do a three variable function, X, Y, and Z, for the following guy. F, X, Y, Z. Okay. X to the y power, Z squared, minus one of my favorites. I know you guys all love this function, arctan. Arctan is great, isn't it? <laughs> Someone just said no. That's it. <laughs> really? Arctan is lovely. How about the gamma function? You guys know that? Anyone's, anyone's going to business or finance or anything like that? You should know the gamma function. You should know hyperbolic sign too. The gamma function is like the, is a statistical, fun. I mean, it's used actually quite, quite a bit in higher level math too, but it's a statistical function that sort of makes continuous the, the, the factorial function. That's very, very useful. It's very, very useful statistics. If you don't know it, then you should, you should learn that. If you're going into finance, if you're going so. So I, I would probably not. So let me tell you about the gamma function. It is differential. It's differential. What just happened? Okay. It's differential. Is everyone happy? Right? Life is too short for for easy problems. Okay, solution. Who has, who is a volunteer? Can I get a volunteer? <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, there was an observation there. That's a very good observation. The observation was, if I take this partial derivative with respect to x first, this guy, what did I say to think of partial derivatives as? Take the other variables and keep them constant. There's no x in here. So if I take the partial derivative of this with respect to x, it's zero, it's constant. Clairot, Clairot tells us something. Clairaut says it doesn't matter the order. What about these guys? Right, that with respect to y, that's constant. What about this guy? That's also with respect to y. So this is zero by Clairaut's theory. Now I did, you did need to know that, well, I probably should have said this is not just differentiable, but smooth. People know what smooth is? I mean, you guys are all, you all know what smooth is, but you know what mathematically smooth is? <laughs> smooth means it has infinite derivatives. It's differentiable infinitely many times. You can take as many derivatives as you want. They're all defined, they all are continuous, all, all the derivatives. There's also the notion, as I said above, of operators. These are operators. And there's also the notion of smooth operators. <laughs> it's true, I'm not lying. So concepts over computation, right? Concepts over computation. Try to look at, use linearity, namely that you can break down an expression like this into pieces and then use the fact that you can take whatever first partial you want first to kill it, okay? Even when you don't know what's going on. Uh, it does. Ah, because, how did I get zero? Because I wrote that wrong. <laughs> I wrote it wrong, this would be y squared. Thank you, good point. That first term has a, yeah, I'm sorry. First of all, I got 
when I was looking at it, I, I actually didn't, couldn't read my own handwriting. Okay. Pardon me. Thank you for that. Yes, this is independent of Z. I wanted to actually, that, that kind of confused me. Actually. Yeah, each one is independent of one of the variables, each of the summons. Thank you. All right, so now some general business. So there are two types, and this course will not deal with this material, but you will be dealing with this material when you go off into other courses. If you have not already seen some of it in, you know, in your differential equations course. But for differential, differential calculus, this part of the course is primarily consumed with de derivatives, not integrals uh, in several variables. The, what you go into here is you go into partial differential equations. So there's two types of differential equations, broadly speaking, that you consider, ODEs and PDEs. Everyone knows? O stands for ordinary. This is ordinary differential equations. This is partial differential equations. Ordinary meaning one variable. Partial meaning partial derivatives are several variables. The main applications of this course that you will see in mathematical modeling will be PDEs, solving them, creating them, putting them into models. PDEs are going to be the main, that and maybe optimization. So these are the main kind of issues. Some PDEs that are famous, that I want you to be aware of, and I think there are some in the homework. Harmonic equation, describing vibrations of drums, and so on. This is what's known as there's this Laplacian delta, capital delta of F equaling zero. What is capital delta? It's a second order partial differential equation, del squared F, or del squared del X squared, plus del squared, del y squared. This is known as the Laplace, after Laplace. <laughs> There's the heat equation, which describes sort of the evolution of heat, how heat distributes through a medium in kind of with perfect conduct conduction and so on. There's all kinds of, there are of course, all types of variations of these make things inhomogeneous, so on and so forth. But these are, this is the general idea. So you take a partial with respect to time and you let it equal this Laplacian. You solve this equation and it tells you sort of how heat spreads, how heat changes in a medium. Again, you have to put some variables in here, but this is the basic structure. And of course, for those that are in physics, or maybe mechanical things with the wave equation, which governs many, many different things. This is, looks a little like the heat equation, but it's sort of more invariant with respect to the Minkowski space time. Oops. So this will describe propagation of waves in space it describes a lot of the things like photons and light and things of that sort. So these equations are things you can learn out about in, our, in a PDE course, um, but the main, main applications of what we're going to do. All right. 